I'm going to talk about a like a real live large scale scientific project that uses uh, the same versions of what you're doing on a much larger scale, which is actually being applied for two reasons: uh, to advance science and our knowledge, and secondly, to help people decide, such as public health officials, what policies we should have that govern our society. And so modeling is a big player in this whole uh, situation. The work that I'm doing is part of a much larger network of researchers called the MIDAS Network. And MIDAS stands for Models of Infectious Disease Agent Study. It's part of the National Institute of General Medical Sciences, which is kind of the research arm of NIH. It's a serious effort on the part of NIH and the US government to understand infectious disease propagation within the US and around the world, and to understand what kind of policies we could have to make better outcomes, so to speak. I wanted to say a little background on you know, how modeling, or computer modeling in particular, that I'm talking about, really is used in, in the way of science. As you know, a model is a representation of a real life or a hypothetical situation on a computer. Sometimes we want to know, we want to do that to understand how the system could work that we're modeling. Sometimes we want to understand how the system, maybe not how it works, but how it could behave. If, for example, we did an intervention or tried to you know, stop a, a raging or possible pandemic, for example. In terms of modeling, uh, we are taking a computational uh, approach to infectious disease, what's called ep epidemiology. Obviously, there's always a tension between the real world and all its complexity and details, and then what we can do in the computer, because we can only model a small portion of those details. So then modeling becomes an art. We have to be selective in what details we put in to represent the essential processes that are operating in the computer that then we can go back and say something important about the real system. So let's talk about modeling Chicago, and in particular, community-associated MRSA. Well, it all begins with a bacteria that's called Staphylococcus aureus. And uh, there's basically a picture of it. Um, generally, staph lives on your skin and is harmless. Uh, it's estimated that between 25 and 40 percent of all people simply have colonies of uh, staph that just continue to live and reproduce on their skin without doing any, necessarily without doing any harm. Uh, other people aren't colonized. The reasons, well, there's other bacteria on your skin that are eating away at the staph bacteria. Uh, you know, and your immune system may have specific, you know, antigens and things that, that kind of come back the whole, the whole situation. Uh, but anyway, when you're colonized, it's totally asymptomatic. You, you don't know that you're colonized. You can't tell. Um, however, even when you're colonized, you can transmit uh, staph through skin, to skin contact. More so than uh, contact with what we call fomites or, you know, uh, in, inanimate objects. Although people are constantly studying that. There's a lot of studies that show, you know, staff could be on these counters or tables or things like that. But the possibility of actually getting infected, you getting infected by that, is, seems to be fairly low based on available evidence. <coughs> okay, so, um, Anyway, let's talk about MRSA. Uh, there, was, there was a variation of staph bacteria that evolved a particular uh, resistance to methicillin in beginning in the 1960s. Uh, and methicillin is basically an artificial form of penicillin. So that whole constellation of antibiotics that's basically penicillin-based uh, has no effect if you get uh, uh, colonization or, or infection. Colonization generally is not a bad 
you know, or, or severe problem. However, colonization often leads to infection. So you could actually infect, <coughs> you know, infect yourself. For example, if you have a lesion or a uh, an abrasion and things like that, that the bacteria in your skin may get into your bloodstream. Uh, ultimately, there are people who uh, have deep seated, you know, uh, soft tissue infections in their body, and at that point, it, it MRSA can actually advance to the point where it kills you. Uh, there are, however, antibiotics of a, of you know a newer type and more powerful, more expensive, etc., that can combat MRSA. The problem that it has occurred is that physicians and, and and others may not recognize, you know, an infection as a MRSA infection. Often they're confused with things like spider bites, etc. Okay, in the 60s. Uh, Healthcare-associated MRSA, as it was called, became a big problem. And perhaps if you've heard of MRSA before, uh, or you know, know people that work in the healthcare industry, you know that they're always very concerned about uh, MRSA in the hospital setting. People go into the hospital for some affliction, they come out with a MRSA infection. It's, uh, it's at a very high rate, actually. Some hospitals are worse than others, etc. But um, at that point, uh, MRSA was thought to be spread from person-to-person -person contact. So healthcare workers could simply spread it from one person to another, uh, just based on their touching of, of the people involved. But there was very little spread outside the healthcare community. So it seemed to be fairly contained, and hospitals uh, and other healthcare installations then developed special procedures to try to uh, control and eliminate contact and, and instill monitoring, surveillance, things like that. However, in the 1990s, and this is the new part, novel strains of the bacteria developed and they began to spread outside the healthcare setting back into the community. So uh, with, at the University of Chicago with the doctors that I work with on this project, they began see, uh, seeing many children coming from the community who actually had uh, MRSA infections. And these children have never had any contact whatsoever with the healthcare uh, facilities or industry. So it turned out that when the genetics was done, uh, there, there was a new form of the bacteria that was much more virulent uh, and able to survive in the community at large outside the healthcare setting. So that's Community associated MRSA is the name. And uh, basically, um, it is a serious skin and soft tissue infection. Uh, there is geographic variation, uh, like between the United States and Europe. It is a worldwide problem, things like that. Uh, there was a uh, trend in Chicago starting in. Uh, the early 2000s, where there were just a few cases, but this rapidly spread to uh, an incidence rate of 260 per 100,000 in, you know, by the year 2007, and eventually increased continuously to uh, 2010. There are some, some groups of people are more high risk than others, is another factor. Um, as I mentioned, spread skin to skin. Colonization is enormously more common than infection, but we don't really know how many people are colonized because it's asymptomatic. However, if people present themselves at the hospital and they do have an infection typically, then one could do a test and genetic analysis actually to look at and determine the particular strain that uh, the person has of, of staff. Whether, you know, there, there are many, many strains, but for the most part, the majority of strains have been the CA MRSA type uh, recently. Uh, when a person gets uh, colonized, that colonization may simply uh, clear itself or it may continue indefinitely. It may also lead to uh, infections. Um, so a person may go through many cycles of colonizations, infections, colonizations, and then clearing. 
and then repeat the whole cycle. So everyone is a little different in that regard. But um, in terms of modeling MRSA then, what we wanted to begin with is a model of a person that could be applied to the agents in our little model, which uh, I guess you're using the turtle terminology. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, on the right there, we have basically three states a person could be in. Either susceptible, uh, meaning they're not, they don't have a co current colonization, or they could be colonized, which is asymptomatic, or they could be ultimately infected. And the, trans the arrows up there represent the transitions that are possible over time between these different states that a person could go through. So what we were trying to do is, since the disease is in the community at large, is to develop a large-scale model of Chicago that would effectively model the process of uh, how the uh, community associated immersive moves through the entire population of the city of Chicago. Uh, to do that required us to create a synthetic population of uh, essentially everyone in Chicago. So we have 2.9 million agents or turtles in our model. Um, and what we do in the model is to model contact uh, that occurs between people um, because of their proximity and co-location as they go through their daily activities. Some of the time when people are co-located in a particular setting, uh, they may transmit the bacteria from one to another whether they're colonized or infected, it's possible, with a certain probability. I think similar to the kind of things you've been yeah, working through in your model. So by doing a simulation of people moving around in Chicago and going through their daily activities, being co-located in like activities, and modeling the probabilities of you know, the disease spreading from one person to another, we can develop a whole profile of what the city looks like relative to the number of people colonized, the number of people infected, and things like that. The, 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 the last aspect we were trying to look at was uh, how people might behave in terms of how they react to an infection, that is, do they go seek medical care or not, uh, as well as uh, the kind of interventions that someone might do to uh, try to help people uh, affect behavior that could result in, you know, a bettering of the situation for them and for the community at large. So, uh, in a nutshell, we model people, but we don't actually model individual people. We model uh, a whole population of people such that no single agent in our model corresponds to a single person per se, but if we added up all of the attributes of everyone, you know, their, their socioeconomic you know, uh, characteristics, et cetera, it would all add up to the whole population. Um, so we're not actually model, you know, we don't actually have you in our, in our model, I, I, so you shouldn't be concerned. <laughs> but we have an agent that probably <coughs> stands in for you in the model. Well, you have 2.9 million. Yeah, we do have, right. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we have people, agents, and we have places, and we have the activities that they engage in. So as an agent in Chicago uh, goes through its daily activities, we track or simulate where the agent goes to school, to work, uh, to jail. We have a component of... of uh, uh, agents that do go to jail, uh, people go to hospitals, and a small number of activities that are really important, I should add, for MRSA transmission to occur. We also model that the behaviors that people may engage in, based on some surveys we've done and things like that. As I mentioned, I know you can't read this, but it's basically uh, on this side a flowchart of an individual's decision-making process as they uh, get, are infected and decide whether they're seeking care or they're going to do self-care and all the events that occur after they make those decisions. 
ultimately resulting in them either uh, being uncolonized or colonized. So for every agent, uh, this decision-making process occurs. And depending upon the characteristics of the people involved, based on our surveys, they have a propensity to, to make one kind of decision or another. Uh, so we're trying to capture what actually could occur in response to situations. Um, we also consider, you know, like uh, uh, networks, people's social networks, and where they get information from, and how they that might influence, you know, their decision. So anyway, this is essentially the best graphic uh, I have, you know, to, to on, on on the model itself. Um, if you can't read these, we have these various places: household, workplace, school, nursing home, hospital, gym, jail college dorm represented. Uh, the little uh, icons on the map are all the places in Chicago. So we actually represent each individual household. And those, those are the orange dots that kind of blend together and create a, a backdrop. There's 2.9 million individual agents. They move to and from 1.2 million geolocated places. On a, and we simulate that movement on an hourly basis over a period of 10 years try to understand the process of how the epidemic built up from, from nothing. Each agent has individual behaviors, engages in activities, response to disease, and health care interventions, etc. So over this simulated period, there's over 3 trillion individual contacts that occur that we simulate in the model and simulate the outcomes of those contacts based on people's disease state. Uh, this graph is something that shows both historical data as well as simulated data that comes out of our model. So here we have uh, the year 2001 when the epidemic began, moving through the year 2010 when things leveled off. This shows the uh, MRSA, CA MRSA incidence for 100,000 people and um, the, 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 the red line here is actual historical data that was based on a meta-analysis of people actually uh, coming to Chicago's uh, you know, hospitals and things like that, uh, presenting themselves with uh, CA MRSA infections. The, the, the bluish band of, uh, that there represents the uh, aggregate output from the model, where we're looking at the number of infections that were actually coming out of the simulation. So the processes that we've modeled have allowed us to essentially reproduce the epidemic as it, as it began in its early stages. The reason that's important is because, because the model is so detailed and we can track every single agent through time, what, what, where they've been, we can track uh, uh, their behaviors, etc. We can extract uh, the, the, the specific factors or situations or reasons as to why the buildup actually occurred from the detailed model results, which are simply not uh, available from the real world. Nobody kept collected data on these things. So then we can begin to do experiments with our model to say what if this uh, was different, whether the transmission rate was a little lower or there had been a some kind of uh, intervention. What if those things occurred? Would the epidemic still have occurred or not? So it, it's a very useful tool for that kind of analysis. We were also able to, taking a very uh, geographically uh, dispersed view, because we have our agents you know, in specific places, to uh, reproduce the patterns of MRSA colonization that uh, were occurring by zip code, by year, in the city. Um, if this animation was working properly, uh, what you'd see is these these red, you know, um, circles kind of growing over time, reflecting the changing distribution across the city. What we are, are doing now is to answer several scientific questions related to to MRSA. Uh, as I mentioned, what, what were the primary factors? Um, 
and how does the heterogeneity of the population, the fact that people respond differently in terms of both their behavior as well as their, uh, their reaction to, to the pathogen itself, uh, you know, what effects could those be and how could they have changed things? Uh, we're looking at uh, what the possibilities are for changing people's behavior. And we're studying what the role of hospitals really was in the, uh, the, the, the epidemic buildup. We're also studying the role of the Cook County Jail and the, uh, in the buildup as well. Everybody has a theory, you know. Like there's a theory that, well, the jail was the real source and it really promoted things. Uh, people have a theory that it all came from the hospital, and, you know, it's still coming from the hospital. So the model allows us to at least test those theories out. Uh, and uh, really inform the whole scientific discussion that leads to better policies, potentially. 